We're going to be live in just a moment. Okay, usually it takes it just a second to connect. And then let me just make sure everything is working as it should. Hopefully people are able to get on right away. And there is going to be a slight delay between what we say and what people hear, which is totally normal. Okay, it looks like we are good. Yay. Okay, so hello. Welcome to Escondido Public Library's virtual author chat series. Today's panel is in partnership with the Rick Sabbath Bookstore, which we're so happy about. I'm your host for today, Jessica Buck, and I am joined by authors Stacey Agder, Felicia Grossman, B. Koch, Koch, Koch. Oh my gosh, see, I've already, <laughs> no, and Hannah Reynolds. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you to our authors for being here and for putting up with me already saying the names incorrectly. And to everyone watching, you can order books by the authors from the Rip Bodice Bookstore. The link to their website is in the chat description. If you have any questions for the authors, please feel free to add those to the comments and we will get to them as they come up. So thank you again, all of you for being here today. Thank you to Stacy for being the brain of this entire panel and for, I just was the assistant. Stacey did it all and I, we just helped out and we're so happy to be a part of this. So thank you so much, Stacey. And to start us off, let's just talk a little bit about you, tell our viewers who you are. And let's start with Stacey since you're the reason we're here. First of all, thank you everybody for coming and joining me on this wild ride. Um, both the author, amazing authors who I'm chatting with Jessica, you too, for like everything you've been doing and to um, anybody who's watching out at home. Um, I, my name is Stacey Agron. I am from New York, um, not very far from uh, New York City. Uh, fun fact, the town I live in is both known for its connection to literary history um, involving a legend of a horseman and also not very far from my favorite hockey team's practice facility. Um, I am an avid reader, I'm a huge hockey fan, clearly, and also um, I'm a very proud romance writer, former reviewer. Um, my book, History of Us, came out um, on June 24th, and that is the second book in my Friendships and Festival series, and I'm just really, really happy to be here. I mute myself, okay. Um, how about Felicia, why don't you go next? Hey, um, I'm Felicia Grossman. Um, I write historical romance. Um, my first two books um, were set in the United States. They're Jewish historical romance. They're set around where I grew up in Wilmington, Delaware. Um, I now though live in the very cold Cleveland, Ohio, which is why I'm wearing a sweater, even though the rest of the country is really cold. Um, and um, I am a, besides being a writer, I am a lawyer and I um, like to uh, bake a lot and um, I am so happy to be here and thank you so much to the library and to Stacy and to everyone. I'm really excited. Okay, I was trying to be good and just mute myself, but now it's like I have to change multiple things to get myself unmuted. So I'm just gonna keep myself <laughs> unmuted. Um, let's have Hannah and then B. Great. Um, I also love to bake, so <laughs> great things there. I just finished writing a scene where the characters bake the New York Times recipe for chocolate babka. And now I think I want to bake it, even though it's a 14 step process and takes two days. Um, in other news, my name is Hannah. I am the author of The Summer of Lost Letters, which just came out, I don't know, like two weeks ago. It's been quite the whirlwind. And I live in Boston. The book is about a girl from Massachusetts, but it is set in Nantucket. The girl goes there for the summer to find out about family secrets. I never got to go to fancy beach clubs to find out about family secrets, but you know, now I get to visit, so that's nice. Also, yes, also, I would like to thank Stacy and Jessica for this because it's also a very exciting event. I feel like this is a really fun topic to get to talk about, especially with so many great writers. 
Hi, I'm B Koch. I'm uh, the co-owner of The Ripped Bodice with my sister Leah. And um, I'm also the author of Mad and Bad, Real Heroines of the Regency, which is about some of the um, fascinating real women who lived during one of my favorite historical time periods, early 19th century. Um, it's mostly about English women, but you, you get a little bit of other, other countries in there as well. Um, I also love to bake. I can't believe I'm on a panel with all Jewish women who love baking. It's, it's quite fascinating. <laughs> um, and babka is my specialty. So maybe I'll share my recipe for rainbow sprinkle babka with everyone after this. That sounds amazing. <laughs> I need to bake more. <laughs> <laughs> so um thank you so much for, for sharing about you the next question is what was your journey to becoming a writer and let's just go with the same um not list Stacey you go first <laughs> um so fun fact I don't cook I don't bake either but I love to eat even though history of us does in fact have a baking scene where my characters make hamantasha um, I, um, I think for me, the best way to say is that I've always written. I don't think there's ever been a time where I haven't. I think the idea was always whether I was going, you know, what I was going to do with it. You know, my writing was always something private, something just for me. Um, I'm not quite sure what, I think, I think it was the bar, the sort of period of the bar exam, um, when I decided that maybe that you know, this thing that I was going to keep to myself to do on the side is going to be my primary sort of occupation, I guess, for lack of a better word. Um, so, you know, I've written, you know, God for years, like some ridiculous stories about like random things, um, including um, an expedition to pick up pieces <laughs> challenger from, uh, um, you know, from underwater. So I've been writing, as I said, from from when I was little to God to now, and and I I just I write contemporary mostly. I write I've written paranormal and, and historical as well. But um, history of us was the is the close is some is like the closest I've ever been to actually writing a historical where, you know, I talk about where like you know. The time that I've spent over the years on Long Island um, with friends and with family kind of drove the story in a lot of ways. So it's kind of like I write a lot of what I love and what I see. So thank you. Sorry, I was just muted for a second. This dog. <laughs> <laughs> the, one, the one family member I can't control, um, figure out. Um, I, like Stacy, I've kind of always written. Um, I used to write in, especially in high school and college, a lot of plays as I did a lot of theater stuff. And I never, it, I, and it was, we, I had people who I've done them with people and stuff like that just for sort of fun. But I always sort of played around with, uh, with novels. And I always was, I'm a, I was a history major and besides a double in English and history. So I always was sort of drawn to history. So a lot of mine skewed historical. Um, and as, uh, so I, it took me a while to decide to do anything with them, but eventually, I think it was when my second child started sleeping through the night, it was like, huh, maybe I should figure out what to do with something. And that's sort of how like the journey towards like publishing stuff began. And I've been very, very lucky on it. And it's been fun and I've met awesome people. I hate to just be a copycat, but same also always wrote, so just always fun. And I also did a similar thing where I uh, studied both writing and archaeology. So, you know, when you do that, I was like, should I go get my PhD in archaeology? And I'm like, nah, maybe I'll just write books about other people who actually did. <laughs> so I wrote three books also with uh, Karina Press, which is Harlequin's digital arm. Um, and then I worked for a really long time on a retelling of Queen Esther that just like, 
didn't sell, which was deeply upsetting. But that's publishing. The thing about publishing is it's like you got highs and lows. And sometimes those lows will last a while. But like if you just keep chugging away, I feel like the highs can come back. And so then I switched back to writing contemporary again. But I feel like my story is always I try to write a fantasy novel, I can't sell it. I sell a contemporary novel instead. And then I'm like, all right, can I write a fantasy novel again? So stay tuned for 10 years from now where I finally sell a fantasy novel. I guess mine's a little different because I write nonfiction uh, mostly and I've tried to write fiction in the past, but it, it's much harder for me. Um, but I also had a love of history and I read so many Regency romance novels growing up, um, like not always the best ones. Some of them had some really questionable things in them, but also you learn a lot about history through those romance novels um and I was so inspired by that I got my graduate degree in fashion history I wanted to let you learn even more about the clothing they were talking about um and then Mad and Bad was born from this document I kept on my computer just fascinating women I want to write about one day subsection Jewish women <laughs> so that the first chapter I wrote was about the Jewish women um and I hope one day I can return to that document and write another Mad and Bad about a different time period because that would be the dream. But um, yeah, writing def definitely doesn't come as naturally to me as being a reader and a researcher, which is my favorite thing. I just love researching so much. <laughs> Someone has to tell me to stop researching and start writing. <laughs> Yay, thank you. I love hearing about how people become or like grow into writers it's just it's so wonderful and I think it's so uplifting for those watching who want to become writers because they know that there's lots of different paths makes them optimistic and hopeful I hope so now you get to tell us um, the viewers and me a little bit more about your books it can be your most recent one if you want um, just so they can learn a little bit more <laughs> okay. So it was interesting, Hannah, that you were talking about the cyclical effect of publishing and how like you do things and then, you know, you come back to something else. And that kind of what was what happened with me. Um, Try to sell paranormal. I ended up my first traditional sale was a Hanukkah short. Um, it was uh, an Avon Books' um, Burning Bright anthology in 2015. 15, 2016. And then I wrote, um, I was very, very lucky and very um, fortunate to participate in a series of um, anthologies called the Rogue Anthologies between 2016 and 20, um, 2018. They were very sort of hard hitting, very strong, very focused political um, anthologies. And the stories that I contributed were about things that I was focusing on at the time. Um, you know, anything from like being an ally as a Jew in the face of increased anti-Semitism to how stupid sticking to sports is to, um, you know, the beauty and joy of Western and Central New York. And despite like conversations about what people were saying about it. And I was writing things that I was processing at the time. And I was like, it was, it was harder for me because usually when I write about something, I've already decided and processed how I feel about it. So it's sort of, it's easier to put it on the page when it's not as um, present, I guess, for lack of a better term. And so after those four stories, I needed a breather, I needed a break. And what did I come back to? Well, I started watching Hallmark movies and I came back to Hanukkah and I wrote a single title, my first solo single, my, the, what would be my first published solo single title book, which is Miracles and Menorahs. Again, coming back to Hanukkah, hmm, I wonder why. Um, and History of Us came out of that the idea of these two different characters finding their way um, in a world that sometimes thinks, thinks Jewish history is painful 
um, they find the joy in Jewish history and, um, you know, the heroine of History of Us is a museum curator. Um, she is also like me, you know, you were saying that you love to research, so do I. I'm a, I, I absolutely love diving in and actually my one attempt at historical was great to research, but writing it was so hard because I can't, you know, for me writing, writing historical was, was basically like um, going underwater. I can only breathe for so long kind of thing. My, my writing, my voice didn't hold. Anyway, point is um, I was very, very happy to sort of write a story that celebrates all aspects of Jewish history and especially sort of focusing on the kinds of history, Jewish history that people talk about versus the kinds of people, history that people don't talk about. Um, so, um, I think in writing historical romance, I always knew I wanted to write Jewish characters. And I started out my Truett series, which is the one with Karina, um, Appetites and Vices and Dances and Devotion, uh, they're set in the United States. Because I think in writing, in writing um, Jewish characters and putting them in the center of historical romances, because romance always has to be your forefront, there's a lot of world building that generally needs to go into it. And out the United Jewish American history is closest to in the 19 in the 18th and 19th century is not that far from contemporary Jewish America in a way that um, European Jewish history, no matter where you are, is very, very different. Um, Jews are very, very different positionally in Europe, even now, but definitely back then. While they are, there's not as much there, you don't need to explain quite as much in, in American history for a variety of reasons where this is one of it, the American Jewish experience is sort of in many ways unique. The closest things you can sort of get to it positionally are certain times in the Ottoman Empire and then pre-expulsion Spain. Um, but even so, it's sort of its own thing. So even so when you're so the world building is there, but it's less and it's an easier bridge to bring readers in and help them sort of understand where you're coming from, because I think, I can't remember who said this, I feel like Sarah McLean might have talked about how historical romance is always a conversation about today. And I think writing 19th century, um, you can always find a conversation about today in Jewish history. I think one of the easiest translations is 19th century Jewish American history, um, which I always think is funny, but I mean, I had most of us who are sitting here did not have ancestors that were in the United States, who are Jewish, did not have ancestors in the United States pre-1881. It was a really, really, really small population. But the way, but because the way our, we are as a people and we are as a community, we sort of become where we are and develop our own culture. So even though those aren't our literal ancestors, in many ways, those are still our act, our cultural ancestors. Um, I had talked one time in a Facebook Live with B about Rebecca Gratz, and in many ways, I have a lot more in common with her personally than I do with any of my ancestors that lived in the late 18th, early 19th century because of that positional thing. So it was really. So I think that was a really fun way to sort of introduce both Jewish community and Jewish lives in historical romance, and then still be able to keep the fun romance front and center and um, that balance. At least I tried. Yeah, I think that's so, that's so interesting. Um, in my in my research, I have, you know, uh, two different families. I think mine is also sort of like, think of it, it's like Stacy's, but they're teenagers. So she's not, she's not a curator. She's just a teenager, but she's also, she's, she's sort of getting to that point where she's really curious and she really likes doing research too. So I'm just like, man, I just write these books where everyone thinks that like, 
doing research is super cool. Like both like the girl and the love interest, they're just like, this seems like a fun way to spend an afternoon. <laughs> but I don't know. I feel like for a lot of people, especially teenagers looking into their family history, it actually is very compelling, especially if say like you have, you have an ancestor who you don't know very much about. So that's sort of how it works in my book where the girl, the girl's grandmother um, the Holocaust survivor, and I think like a lot of people are familiar with this, a lot of survivors don't really like talking about the warrior, so she just like doesn't talk about anything, and so the girl's like, maybe I'll go find some secrets, and I feel like a lot of times in real life, perhaps there like aren't that many secrets, like, but it, it's a book, so there's a lot of secrets, so that's great, <laughs> but what, what I thought was interesting, sort of like what you were talking about, Felicia, is I wanted to make sure that the boy's family had been here in the States for a really long time. So I ended up doing all this history about the Sephardic community in America and how long they had been here. And it was just a very interesting thing to dig into because I think a lot of that history as it's taught in like US history books, it's sort of like, and then Jews sort of arrived in the 1940s and you're like, that's cool, doesn't seem legit, but okay. <laughs> so I sort of liked having a contemporary novel where I got to dig in a little bit to both of the storylines, both like the, oh, you know, actually people have been here for a very long time, but also what, what I'm much more familiar with through my own family history is like coming over after the war. Um, and, oh, and then I also, I wrote some books that when I was younger in my early twenties about being, a hot mess in your early 20s. <laughs> and those don't, those don't very, have very much history in them, but they're just, you know, other, I like to think very fun, fluffy books about being in New York City and bopping around and falling in love. Uh, so my book is uh, about, as I said, the Regency period in England. Um, it's uh, essays about different kind of group groupings of women. Um, Jewish women, women who are um, pursuing careers and um, their interest in the sciences, in the arts, um, LGBTQ women, um, uh, women who uh, for whatever reason have been kind of written out of the historical narrative um, and we don't see as often in romance novels, but I hope, I think that's really changing. I hope it continues to change. Um, and I think we do so often think of the 19th century as this very white Christian um, world. And this book is, was an opportunity for me to kind of uh, bring some of my favorite women um, to the forefront of the conversation. Um, some of them have never really been discussed in concert with each other, which was another really exciting thing that I got to do is talk about networks of women, friendships of women, all these things that sometimes we don't talk about in history books because it's not men killing each other on the battlefield or whatever the headline exciting um, new history news is. Um, but to me, it feels like a really intimate way to get to know these women. Um, and that's really what I tried to do. Um, and it was a really fun project. I'm just gonna uh, so you've all kind of answered <laughs> the next question but there's two parts to it so if you already talked about one part you can answer the second part and vice versa so what inspires you to write these particular stories and what about Jewish history specifically inspired you so I'm gonna hold up these two books I don't know if you can see them this is uh, our crowd which is about the German Jews um, in New York, um, who lived sort of as a parallel and a parallel life to uh, Mrs. Astor's um, 500 or however many. This was, if Mrs. Astor was the 500, these were the 100 um, who had their like lives and it was kind of amazing. And I read that book for the first time when I was in high school. Um, and after um, an event where someone said that Jewish history was so painful. My brain sort of went back to this, that book, to Stephen Birmingham. And I'm just going to briefly put his other book, which is, of course, The Grandies about Sephardic Jews in New York as well. Anyway, um, two years ago, um, I heard, I learned the story of Ohika Castle. Ohika Castle is um, 
a beautiful property on Long Island. It is known on in Huntington, Long Island. Um, I don't know. It's it's known now as this beautifully gorgeous wedding venue, but it's this beautiful castle. And the story behind it just blew my mind in so many different ways. Um, Otto Kahn, who built the castle, came from Germany in the 1900s, found his way into New Jersey, and his family life was flourishing until his house was burned down. The house was burned down because of anti-Semitism. And so Otto Kahn, and again, like when I was doing my research, um, information sort of move back and forth but basically somehow whether he bought it bit by bit or bought the whole parcel he bought this huge parcel of land on Long Island and built a castle that was fireproof so that nobody could um nobody could burn it down again and I was so completely fascinated by that story I was so completely fascinated by the sort of the perseverance of Otto Kahn and what he did and, you know, the, the juxtaposition of someone like Otto Kahn with all of his money still subject to anti-Semitism in the 19, you know, in the, in the 1910s, 1920s, as a parallel to what was going on in the Gilded Age books that we see in romance novels and otherwise, again, um, the, you were talking about how people think that you know, history is solely white and Christian in the Regency. Well, the same thing happens in the Gilded Age, except for, of course, the amazing Blucher's books. But like, generally speaking, when you talk about the Gilded Age, you talk about the Vanderbilts and you talk about all of these Christians and it's like, come on. So when I heard about this story and, and the, the, the resilience of Otto Kahn, I wanted to do something with it. But then I was like, Stacy, you don't write historical, you write contemporary. What is this? So inspired by Otto Kahn, I decided that I wanted to, you know, I wanted to write something inspired by it. And so I created Rockcliffe, Rockcliffe Manor, and my main male character, Jacob Har Horowitz Margaretten's family. Um, they were um, Russian and Hungarian Jews who found their way to Germany who left, who were very good at making money because they are analysts, that's what they do. They found their way to um, New York. They bought the land that became Rockcliffe and got really annoyed that the local town refused to let them build a synagogue. And so what they did was they tore a room off their house, their beautiful manor house, and they turned that into the synagogue. And then incorporated the little town and called it Rockcliffe Manor, named, after, named it after the house. And the town itself became sort of a repository of my memories of stay, you know, staying, staying on Long Island with friends and this sort of, and the beautiful sort of town of Huntington, which is clearly, you know, not as, not as, not as bad as I sort of, I, I play with history to make it. And then on the other side, I was like, how could I, how could I tell that story? How was like, who would be the perfect counterpart to that? Who would be the, the perfect counterpart? And I was like, well, clearly you have to have someone who is interested in studying Jewish history, who is interested in telling the stories of Jewish history in different ways. And I, um, one of a couple of my friends at the time were studying to be museum curators. And I was like, that's, it. So, so my heroine became a curator and later in um, another book, which I will talk about later, um, you know, she, she talks about having gone to museum school like my friends. Um, and there had been, when I went to visit the Center for Jewish History in New York, um, that had a couple of fantastic exhibits about the history of Jewish social justice. And I think that something called like the Poison Pen Club or something that was very specific in the Yiddish newspapers about being very specific about um, fighting back against um, policies that they didn't like, anti-immigration. They were fighting back against anti-immigration policies and just general sort of Christian nonsense, basically. And it was it was it was something that I had never heard of. I'm like, this is amazing. I was like, this is the kind of thing that my heroine would want to make an exhibit about. And 
you know, tying in the impossible relationship trope, made a book out of all of it. So. Oh, um, so yeah, so I talked a little bit. So, okay, so I talked about a little bit before, but also let's be real. I wanted to write historical romances where somebody got like me got to wear a ball gown for once. I mean, that's that's the real thing too, because I wanted one of the pretty to have somebody who I could have been to have a pretty dress on the cover. And um, I mean, Appetites was every, again, that somebody had always said that your first book is your id. Appetites was my complete id. It's, it, there's a lot of very little me in Ursula Nunez. Um, but I also wanted, there's so much misconceptions about American Jewish history. And I, I didn't notice this until I became active on Twitter, but you will see stuff that like within the Jewish community, because I think we're looking for, we're often looking for a frame, especially in sort of social justice Jewish, to be able to talk about our history against other histories. And we'll use terms that don't make sense in the, that we have like sort of misconceptions of who we are and how we got to where we are. Um, like I taught, like I grew up in, with a family that was pretty involved in our, um, in the conservative movement. And like the idea, and like movement Judaism, um, especially conservative American reform and conservative Judaism are very American. They're 19th century American. The move, the movement splint Judaism doesn't happen until the 19th century, but that's the period we're all still in. That's the root of our period. So like we try to talk about Jewish cultures in ways like I, I, I hear this term that drives me in, that drives me batty, Ashkenormative. Um, so Ashkenazi, Sephardi, um, you know, we have about Mizrahi and for some of us over here in the Balkans and stuff, like my, some of my family, Romanoid, um, those are referred to, like we try, I, I see a lot of people use them almost as racial terms and they're not. They're about Jewish custom and minhag. And um, they, and so because Jews are historically migrated a lot, um, even in periods where we had sort of distinct communities with their own cultural rituals and, and customs, we still sort of always, we flowed in and out of those communities. So they always influenced each other, but no more, greater place than the United States, especially in both Reform Judaism and Conservative Judaism, where your rituals, because you had a, a larger Sephardi Western European Sephardi population than Germanic Ashkenazi, um, you ended up with um, customs that were had a Sephardi base and you would sprinkle in. Um, that's definitely how conservatives sort of evolved. Um, Reform Judaism in the United States um, was supposed to be a combo minhag plus some stuff that Isaac Mayer Wise sort of made up himself. But like, this is, I'm trying, this is this idea that like, this is the reason that somebody like me, whose family came from, say, the Western Ottoman Empire and the Pale of Settlement, chants Torah in British Sephardi trope, had always grew up with the Sephardi hop Torahs and um, use a Sephardi pronunciation of, of Hebrew and knows no Yiddish at this point, um, except for what I'm learning on du Duolingo because of the way sort of things evolved in the United States. And this is sort of, and I think it was sort of important to sort of put some of those cultural developments in Judaism in the 19th century. If you look at those books, there's like, no, there's like a theme sort of this, fa uh, this family is sort of edging along to what will become conservative Judaism and how that sort of evolved as a culture, as a cultural thing in the United States and how that's sort of a lot of our, again, historical inheritance. We have our own home Judaism and customs and food too, but we also have communal um, culture. So it's a lot, 
more complex than I think a lot of people want to talk about, because I think so much in history, we talk about where does your family come from? And that makes sense in certain cases. It makes less sense with a lot of Judy, with a lot of Jewish family, because again, there was so much, we got kicked out of so many places. And even our older communities had influxes of Jews at, diff at different times through here. We were, and we were never the majority culture of any one place, except for in our, except for in our own little communities. So like when, if you're writing a real, a regular region, a, a white Christian, English Regency romance, you know, the family's been in England forever. Their title dates back before Henry VIII and this and that. You really don't, you're not going to get that. So you're not going to be, you're in Jewish diaspora stuff. You're never going to be the people in, in power writing the rules solely yourself. And most likely your roots in the community are at least at least in parts of your family are never that old and are and are now and are just a little bit different like I always think people bristle a lot of people wonder why Jews bristle at um be Jews from like the pale bristle at being said that they're from Poland when first of all they were sort of forced into that area at the time and they never worked to, and if you, anybody who left before the 1920s was never considered, Pol was never considered Polish, had, had, didn't have any rights. They were forced in there in the Pale of Settlement. But even so, the, even the Jews that weren't forced into that area in the, after the creation of the Pale by Russia, that community had only had been there since the expulsions in France and Spain in the early, in the late Middle Ages, early Renaissance. I mean, it's, you can't, it's a constant ebb and it's a constant ebb and flow in a way that I don't think people are really know how to talk about. Now I'm rambling, so I'll go to Hannah. <laughs> no, that's all super interesting. I feel like I didn't know a lot of that. Um, but I guess, so I'm just going to like take it back up several centuries of modern day. So when I, when I was just thinking about like, oh, why did I write this book? I grew up reading like a lot of Meg Cabot and Sarah Dessen and just like very like spunky teenage girls go about and like do all the things. And it's great. And I also grew up reading a ton of Regency romance. But I'm like very curious about all the ones that you read because I read a lot of them too. And they were also ones, they were very similar to a lot of the YA actually. Again, spunky young girl, especially like a lot of ones I read, they were in fact... 17 or 18 years old or pretty young goes out and like gets all the things and I was just like that sounds great that's sort of what I want to write I was like but we don't do dukes and we're also like not actually if I'm writing about 17 year olds they're not gonna like fall in you know they're not gonna marry the dude right away but so I was sort of like how can I evoke this sort of you know, historical romance setting that I sort of love slash also I, the other thing I read a ton of and still do is fantasy and sci-fi. So in, how do I evoke sort of this fantasy world setting? So I decided, oh, well, I'll put it on this island, which sort of feels a little bit like a fantasy world. Like I, I like to think of it as quite kind of a portal fantasy because, you know, Massachusetts, right? We're kind of like normal and chill. And then Nantucket is sort of like you took it off 50 notches. And, but it's this beautiful, beautiful island, but it is hard to get to and it's pretty exclusive, you know, for, for the summer people at least. And so I thought like, how do I make a family that's like our equivalent of a, of a dukedom, you know, or something. And so I decided, well, I need them to have been there for a long time. And I did all this research about Nantucket. And then I was like, all right, cool, cool, cool. Now I know about Nantucket and the whaling days. And that's when they came of age. And how do I make it Jewish? Because I just wanted them to be Jewish. So I was like, all right, let's backtrack a little bit. So then I was like, cool, maybe I can have, there were some Jews in New Bedford and Providence in the 1800s. And New Bedford did whaling, so I'll just have them, they just ended up on Nantucket too, it's fine. So I was like a little creative with some things going on, but I think like the great thing about fiction and about both YA and romance is I think they're both very like optimistic genres where you, you do sort of get to do what you want and you do just get to sort of like 
make the happy ending and make things like be optimistic and make people laugh, which is all I really ever want to do with the books that I'm writing is just like make people happy. And so, yeah, so I feel like that was sort of, I, I ended up doing a lot of research, but it was a lot of it was like in service of just like making all my characters Jewish because that was what I wanted. And it, it's similar to what you said, Felicia, was just like, I just want like kids like me to get to fall in love and do their thing, you know? So that was, that was sort of the way that I, I thought about it. And then of course I wanted to also, um, also like explore, you know, the tension between the two of them. So similarly to Stacy too, where I was like, all right, what is the opposite of a girl be, who's like super nosy? It's a boy who really doesn't want anybody like digging into the family history. So it had that same sort of like clashing, um, which I think is just when you think, when you're writing, you think about like, well, what is the best pairing of my character? You want them to bring out things in each other, but you also want them to be sort of positioned so that like, it's not perhaps like too easy. So I guess that's sort of like what I thought about and a little bit of the, the history behind that. But I think I, I like to do both history, but I also really go for that, that vibe of like, I think of it like the Julia Quinn vibe. I know she's very trendy right now because of the Bridgerton deal, but like that sort of like spunky um, or Meg Cabot, like just like a lot of witty banter. So that's, that's where I landed. I was inspired to write my book by um, so many wonderful customers at the Rift Bodice who would come in and we they'd ask for a historical romance novel and I'd be so excited to suggest a Week to be Wicked by Tessa Dare, which is inspired by the real life of Mary Anning, who was a young woman who um, ended up discovering a number of fossils in um, England and becoming a very well-known seller of fossils. Um, she often wasn't credited correctly for her discoveries. Um, she sold them to other men who then took credit, but she's a real person fascinating woman a movie's coming out about her with a uh, Saoirse Ronan and Kate Winslet Ammonite and I would be telling everyone all this about the real woman and a I could tell that like a lot of people didn't believe me that I was kind of making this up but that also that they didn't realize that so many of the historical romance novels we love are inspired by real women um, so often. Uh, I, I personally love a historical romance novel that ends with an author's note telling me about the real woman, place, whatever event that inspired that author. Um, and so many of them have, have those. So I realized that there was this kind of disconnect between our general idea of the Regency period and the women who lived then and um, who actually lived then and what they were actually doing and the amazing art they were creating, um, the science they were discovering, the love and relationships they were having. Um, and so I really wanted to write about all of that. And I'm so lucky that I, I got to. Um, and I, I hope that, yeah, we can just, can, I, Felicia mentioned that on Twitter, sometimes people tend to um, make things so narrow. And so what I often saw was people like knocking historical romance novels for their lack of authenticity, which I, I was always like, there's so much research in these, but there could be even like, we could be inspired by other more different women that haven't been. So there were just so many reasons. I felt like it was the perfect time to write this book. Um, and now it's out. Hey, thank you. I'm looking at the clock. Oh my gosh, we have so many questions and so little time. <laughs> Should have made this like a three hour panel, but then you probably would have hated me. <laughs> so you talked a little bit about what inspired these stories about the Jewish history that inspired you and all the research you've done. So what are some of the challenges of writing Jewish history in romance? Do you want to go first, Stacey? Or do we want to have someone else go first? I'm game for whatever. Someone else go first. You want to switch it back and I'll, I'll start and we'll go yeah. back. <laughs> let's, do that. let's do that. I mean, I'm not writing about Jewish history specifically in a romance novel, which I, 
I imagine is very hard. Um, but the Jewish chapter of my book um, focuses on 19th century England and America. As Felicia mentioned, I talked about Rebecca Gratz and some uh, women in America who were in conversation with Jewish women in, in England, in France, um, and the way that I, I particularly focused on um, women from higher economic um, statuses because I do think so often the history of Jewish uh, women is told as a sad um, history. We so often focus on women living in po people living in poverty, um, and especially in romance novels, when Jewish characters did appear historically, like Georgette Heyer, not so great. A lot of anti-Semitism. Um, and in doing my research, I realized that there were all these women living a very different life than what we're often told they were allowed to live. Um, so I was so fascinated to learn the stories of Judith Montefiore, whose last name I always mangle, um, who her sister married a Rothschild. She was a very high society and her uncles even um, hosted the Royal Dukes at the synagogue in London, um, which was like a big event that was written about in the newspapers. And um, I, I was just so excited to write that chapter because I did feel like it gave me a chance to write about women who had really, really happy, Jewish women who had really, really happy lives. Um, not always, obviously, no one's life is always happy, but um, Judith was married to a man named Moses Montefiore who uh, was obsessed with her, like really <laughs> obsessed with her. And he, after she died, he, continued her legacy and named everything he could find, all the schools he could find after her. Um, and they were a really devoted couple. And it, I think they were childless, which is also interesting. Um, so I was just excited to write about women like Judith, um, Rebecca Gratz, and the way that they advocated for their Judaism um, and also advocated for their families um, and built these lives for themselves in a time period where often told they weren't allowed to exist. That's super interesting. I feel like I also am not writing like too much about his, history, be well, because my history is pretty recent. And so that's sort of interesting because when I'm only going back to the 40s and 50s, a lot of people reading it, I think, have their own personal experiences that they sort of bring to the reading. And therefore, you can get a lot of people being like, oh, but that's not how it was for me, you know. And so I think I, I tend to be very aware of all my different potential audiences because there's a lot of them and some are going to come in with a lot of knowledge and some are going to come in with zero knowledge and I might want to you know go on this like long rant like I'm pretty sure I had both my agent and then also my editor were like Hannah you need to like say less about like refugee law in the 1940s your 16 year old readers like they can google it and I was just like that is fair. So I also ended up with like an author's note in the back because I was just like, oh yeah, like I have to keep in mind that this is, this is a novel. Um, and so like, how do you wind history in, in an engaging manner when you are in fact writing contemporary? So I think that was probably my biggest challenge was just that I wanted to like blab a lot and that wasn't useful. And I also wanted to be like very accurate about like what had happened um, while also creating like I, I created a lot of fictional institutions heavily based on real ones in order to give myself the flexibility to, to have the story work the way I wanted without being like, I would say like disloyal to actual history. So I think that when you're doing that kind of history, I try to be like pretty careful about bending it, but only bending it so far. That's, that's my answer there. Um, well, first, B, I tell my husband all the time, I want to be buried in a copy of Rachel's tomb, like Judith Montefiore too. So <laughs> that's, it's so that's, that's life goals there. Um, but, Adding that uh, to my life goals as well. <laughs> yes, that's what you, we all need a massive, massive fancy copy of Rachel's tomb on our, our property. Um, but also, I mean, I think what, so I do at least, I have written a lot of upper class Jewish characters. So in um, in the 19th century who have in certain ways, I call it the rise of the big mockers, they have a lot of sway over the Jewish community and 
um, sort of have a lot of influences in the Jewish community's goals, um, and those goals tend to tend to be focusing on getting rights and securing certain status and security for better or worse. And I think what's challenging is writing them heroically, because especially with sort of my readership, I know people judge and look uh, and uh, it judge a lot and in, in ways, and these are, I think it's hard to write to sort of make people understand that yes, these people were in many ways very fortunate and fabulously wealthy, but they were doing this in a society that the rule, they didn't make the, the rules to get themselves there. They're doing their best to play somebody else's, to play somebody else's game and survive in a game that they didn't choose and do the best for their community. And we know in hindsight, there are arguments to be made that I've seen being made now that this sort of, that some of the, the and this is the direction of a lot of Jewish institutions, because this is the founding of a lot of Jewish institutions in the United States and England, that directionally they are still concerned with a lot of this stuff. And there are questions of, is this a good thing? Is it too assimilationist? And in hindsight, is 2020 a little bit in this, especially if you're dealing with a marginalized group who's just trying to, who's just trying to get by and do their best for the groups. So I think it's challenging to us to not only tell us that history, to, but to explain it to people who haven't experienced it or don't have a really big concept of it and are likely to judge those characters. And then on the same note, I would really like to write uh, be able to write characters that aren't necessarily fabulously wealthy, but still get an HEA too, and still wear still nice clothes, clothes that look still kind of good, and find an opportunity to um, interest readers in a way to do that, especially because the reason why I think people in the United States, especially the Jewish community in the United States, see their ancestors mostly as sort of poor and down downtrodden is because that was the massive wave of Jewish immigrants, and that is often our direct actual ancestors. And I think there should be a place to honor their stories too, and make because they had to be happy because we're all here. So it's actually been great that I that I am the last here because I literally my particular questions literally sit between Hannah's and Felicia's ideas. Like I'm talking about people who at least at least for my main male character's family like i was talking about people who used what they had to make things better but they're not playing by the rules of their own game they are playing by the rules of someone else's game and using what they have to basically win as much as they could not just for themselves but for others because i think like when you start with that kind of experience um which is a slight variation on, on the story that I'm playing with, the idea that like, you know, the last thing you wanna do is be the kind of person who goes along with rules that, you know, that don't work for you. And, but spending my, my editor, absolutely, not so much my agent, but my editor was like, Stacey, you have to stop. <laughs> like you can't, like this is, this is not, this is not a his, this is not nonfiction actor. This is this is this is an actual romance novel. Can we please not go into the details of like you know of Gilded Age like society and like um, and the specific moments of the archives? Like, can we please actually have more of the moments? Um, God, which is why the impossible relationship trope between my characters was so helpful. But like you know, sort of like finding that balance between like the fulfillment of the relationship trope versus the history versus, I don't want to sort of make my reader, you know, my, I know my readers are going to judge my hero no matter what happens. So I kind of, I was, you know, trying to sort of find that, as I said, I was trying to find that balance between enough history to explain this new stuff that doesn't get talked about. Because again, the whole book is about putting Jews back into the center of the narrative. So like, but the last thing I wanted to do was put too much of it in, hence my author's note <laughs> and sort of like the, the balance that they, these characters had to sort of, um, had to walk, you know, both on the historical side and the contemporary side. Um, 
because you know like like all of us i love research i absolutely love it like i don't even know like this is a folder of stuff that i went and researched because i was like all of those little details whether it's like the kind of um work that my main character does or like how to put a museum exhibit together all of these little details i wanted to know it all because it made sort of it made the book a better story because i knew as much as i could not only about the historical aspects but about the contemporary ones as well because you're world building right you're not just world building the historical but you're building that framework on which you're telling that story as well so um but i was gonna say like yeah I love historicals but it's interesting because the trope that I played with is actually more found in paranormal um you have you know the impossible relationship idea between two people who really should not be together but in fact but they met at a very young age and so of course there's no choice that's it it's done and so this idea of like you know, childhood friends to lovers to not lovers to third chance to can we please get ourselves together, sort of tying all of these things together and like pulling everything tighter. Thank you. I'm just checking Facebook to see we have a lot of viewers who have any questions. So we're going to get to our last two questions and then our closing question. So thank you to everyone watching and everyone watching later when this is recorded. Um, even though we don't know you, we're very happy to be, to be with you in some time and space. So this question is, what are other topics in Jewish history or culture that you would want to write about? Um, Do you want to start, Stacey, or should we? I would like, to, I would definitely, around. um, I'm, uh, so like, I love food. I don't cook. Um, I'm a very excited, very wonderful eater. Um, but one of the things that I've noticed is that in conjunction, like what we, what you were saying, Felicia, earlier about, um, the idea of like wanting to see more stories about, um, the history of those later immigrants, the history of the Ashkenazi immigrants, right? Like the later sort of immigrants to the United States and like who doesn't, who don't necessarily get that much of a spotlight in conjunction with that is their food. And generally speaking, when you talk about, um, when people talk about food in general, like they talk about the specific elements of Jewish food that get sort of like tied into American culture in general. And I kind of want to explore more of that. Like what sort of like, you know, this idea of like, is Ashkenazi food as, you know, as like flat and not spiced as people say it is because 90% of the time when you end up in a conversation about Ashkenazi food, the answer is it is unspiced, flat, and boring. And I kind of want to like investigate more of that and the idea of like different Jewish food from like all over and sort of how that all comes together. So, so yeah, like, going from like history to food just fascinates me that is that is where i want to go next oh gosh me um so this is a difficult question for me because i i will say i'm calling this a vague publishing news watch this space um so there are things i want to write about and i will get to write it and i may get to write about sometime in the future um, but I would, I would like to do things, one of the things I did in the Truex series, I felt like with American Jewish history, because the characters were so integrated in the non-Jewish community, um, you saw sort of both. I would like to write more things that are focused solely in either more insular Jewish communities or just um, like a Jewish, one of the Jewish quarters as a whole. So you sort of get that, the look at the sort of more internal workings of, um, of um, Jewish society at different times, plus with romance. And I'm probably, I'm sticking with contemporaries with like some historical leanings from different time periods for my next couple, I think. But I'm definitely at some point going to write a 
very traditional Regency romance, except the girl's going to be Jewish and the boy's going to be a Duke and it's going to be fine. So that's, that's also on my list. And then I also just like to do like retelling. So, you know, maybe I'll do like an Ivanhoe from Rebecca's perspective at some point. I always think those are, are very fun, but that's just sitting there in the back corner. But I, I love like weird, you know, or, or the less explored corners of history are also very fun. I am also obsessed with Jewish food and I'm also going to pull the big publishing card, but I am working on something that has to do with my favorite Jewish food, which are bagels. So Love watch it. this space. I mean, in like two years from now, watch this space. <laughs> I mean, soon, eventually. <laughs> it's so hard because it's like, oh, no, I want to go even more. I'll have to wait. I'll have to wait and be patient. You will do it. Okay, so our last question before the closing question, this is the question that we always ask at the end of our author chat. So it's our favorite question. Don't feel pressured if you can't think of one or if you think of too many. So what is your favorite library memory? Start. I have one if you guys are, are still thinking I don't know if you guys did this but I like grew up basically at my library it was right next to my high school so I was there all the time so I think when you just spend so much time somewhere you think it's yours so we were just like a mob of teenagers or middle schoolers and we just hung out at the library all the time and we used to do weird things like ride the elevator I don't know why we thought that was fun, but we just ride it up three stories and down three stories and the actual library patrons couldn't use it because there were like five teenagers in it. So I think I just, I don't know. I think I just have a lot of very fond memories of the library really feeling like it was ours. And sometimes the librarians would be like, you guys gotta like chill for a second, but everyone was very sweet. And you know, we took out lots and lots of books. So that's Um, I would say so. Um, my mom took me to the library a ton as a child. I would say this is my favorite romance library moment. And I got regular books at the library, but she would always find me. I would wander back to the wire rack of the romances, the older um, 80s and early 90s historicals with the pretty dresses. And I'd be there like stroking those covers, looking at those dresses. I mean, I'm sure like I looked at the guy too, but mostly just the dresses. I similarly feel like I have too many. I spent my whole childhood at, at different libraries. I don't even know which one to pick. But um, when I was an undergraduate at Yale, I was lucky enough to work at the Lewis Walpole Library, which is in Farmington, Connecticut. If you're ever in Farmington, you have to go visit. It is one of the coolest places in the whole world. And I remember on my first day, I was an intern there. <laughs> um, I think it was like two o'clock. They started turning off all the lights and I was like, what are we doing? What's happening? And they're like, oh, the library shuts down. It's croquet time. And every day this library shuts down and we go play croquet together. And so for a whole summer, I'm really good at croquet. I mean, I have some mad croquet spells because of this, but it just, it's like such a special like Brigadoon place in my mind. Like, does it even really exist? I don't know, <laughs> but I loved playing croquet at the library. Um, so I also spent like childhood at the library, like for sure, like everybody else. Um, the, the library in my town, um, is a Carnegie library. Um, it's somewhat of a historic landmark and it's kind of amazing. And it's, it's, you know, it's, it's been the center of my town for years. Um, but as it's summer, my brain goes right to the summer reading game. And every summer, how I would like do my best to get as many like stickers on the wall as I possibly could. I never won, but I always, I always did my best because I read way too quickly for my own good. So like needless to say, like our usual weekly trips to the library were like filled with like, okay, how many books do you actually need at this point that I want? <laughs> you know, the, the excitement, but um 
I mean, I remember like the YA section when I was, you know, young. So like the Caitlin and the Francine Pascal books and the Eileen Gouge, like teenage books, like that section was the best. And I remember it being sort of, you know, the huge windows to the side and this like section sort of in between the windows and the staircase down to the children's section. And like, I feel like when I was getting books from there at that time in my life, I feel like I'd made it, you know, <laughs> like, you know, the excited little children's section at the bottom with the baseball glove as a seat and then upstairs, like as part of the adult section was this YA and I I love hearing the memories and because you mentioned like the summer reading I I feel like I need to mention now that we're having our summer virtual activity challenge it's going on now until August 8th so you can attend all kinds of events and do all kinds of things to get points and possibly win prizes so check that out on our website and let me just check the Facebook Okay, good. No such a handsome new member of our panel. <laughs> Excuse me, hi Figs. Hi Fig. This is Figaro. He's so cute. What a delight. Oh. Very sweet. So supportive. Very supportive. Well, he's sad because my daughter is gone and she's not with him. She, he's hers. Because she sneaks in food that he shouldn't eat. <laughs> I know some of you mentioned things you can't mention, but just for the those watching now and watching later, so what is next for you? What's what should they be looking out for? If there's another event you're gonna be doing, how can they support you? How can they look out for you? So um, I promised I would show this tonight. This, if you can, let's see if we can, we can make it closer. We can, um, oof, there we go. Here we go. This is my next book. It's coming out in October. A year after Miracles and Menorahs, I write another Hanukkah book. It is about a latke fry off that's set in the small town of Rivertown just next door to Hollowville. The central, the central um, female character of this one is Batia, who is the third of the trio um, from Miracles and Menorahs. And she has to go back to deal, to involve herself in this competition as the web designer and potentially the host. But also going back to Rivertown means she has to confront in certain ways um, the high school crush gone absolutely horribly wrong. Um, who is who just happens to be one of the competitors and this is the book where I get to play with thoughts about Jewish food and about um, you know sort of like what's Jewish food who gets to decide that where you know is it as is Ashkin you know and it's fantastic and researching it made me hungry but yeah October until then um, I will be kind of all over the place. Um, starting um, on the fifth, starting on the fifth of July, I will be doing a series of Instagram lives um, with a whole bunch of amazing authors who um, also wrote books that tie into the themes of history of us. I'm going to post a schedule for that in the next, probably tomorrow. Um, it's going to be fantastic. I am so excited. And then on the 23rd of July, I am doing a panel at Love Sweet Arrow. In con a virtual panel in conjunction with Love Sweet Arrow um, with uh, Bryna Starler, Piper Hughley, and Jeannie Moon, um, each of whom have also written books that have come out recently that I absolutely adore, who, um, whose stories intersect with the themes of History of Us. Um, it has been a wild and it's going to be a wild and crazy summer and I'm looking forward to and I'm looking forward to it. And, uh, up until then, you can find me on Twitter at NYStacy, uh, website at stacyagdern.com, or Instagram at sagdern, uh, and on Spotify, where you can find my crazy playlists. So, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. So, oh, me. Um, so, yeah. So, I 
can't say I can say stuff in like a couple of months like sir I'm thinking end of the summer I will be able to have more information but until then you can um if any questions you can contact me my website's felicia grossman author.com i have a facebook page felicia grossman insta i'm also felicia uh, felicia grossman author and then on twitter i'm at h felicia g but yeah you can ask me stuff other than that the summer i'm moving so i'm available um, and um hopefully but yes watch those spaces because there will be news in the next month or two and so that's the first book the summer of lost letters i am theoretically turning in the second book tomorrow to my editor which is a standalone uh sequel to it and sort of as traditionally happens actually in a lot of historical romances, it is a connected series where you do not need to read any of the previous books. It is about the younger cousin of the boy from the first book. And it is actually also a Hanukkah romance. <laughs> so also set on Nantucket. So like real different vibe than the first one. It's very cold there. Um, and it, it is also a fun classic romance trope where the girl had a crush on the boy when she was younger, but then she professed his love and it went very poorly and now she hates him. But now she needs flirting lessons. Man, who doesn't need flirting lessons? No. I do need flirting lessons. I mean, same. I need both flirting lessons and the book, you realize. No, yeah, it's, it's a lot, you know? It's just him making things up. Anyways, so that's my next one. And you can find me at hannahreynolds.net because .com was taken and all of my other handles are there as well. And thank you guys so much for having us. Um, I don't have anything on the horizon that I can report yet, but if you want to know, if you want to know what's going on, um, follow the Ripped Bodice uh, on Twitter. We, I. I think we don't have a Facebook anymore because it was just too many social medias. But we did just get a TikTok because we're young and hip like the kids. Can't handle that. It's so hard, guys. Oh, my God. <laughs> it took us like an hour to make one freaking TikTok. Anyway, follow us at The Rip Bodice on TikTok, on Twitter, Instagram, all of that. Um, and we are planning a welcome back in-person party the date has not been announced yet because we're you know taking things slow and figuring out what's best for everyone health-wise but um very soon we will be having that and I will be there signing copies of Mad and Bad if you haven't had a chance to get one yet um and all that information will be on their Bodice social media accounts Oh, I'm so excited. Thank you all for being here, for talking with me, for sharing everything. Um, thank you to everyone watching. Now we're live and later when this is recorded, you are also awesome. Um, and of course, go to www.theridbodicela.com to purchase books by all of our wonderful authors and purchase other books that you also want to buy. You should just purchase all of the books. That is my recommendation to all of you. If you are interested in more free online programming like this, check out our Facebook page and our website to see everything we have planned. We have lots of author chats going on. Our next one will be Friday, July 9th at 1 p.m. It's a pop culture panel series on kids, graphic novels, and comics. So thank you again to our authors. Thank you so much to Stacey for imagining this and working with me to make it a reality. It's been so much fun. I love it. And I just want to plead with all of those watching now and later, we have a very short, very easy, only three question virtual event survey. It's in the description of the video and I'm also going to paste it right now in the, um, the comments. You just follow the link, fill out the questions. It lets us know if you want to see more events like this from the library. You don't have to live here or be a or have a library card to do it. We like having these programs for everyone. 
And I'm going to mention, just because I can, that you don't have to live here to have a library card with us. We have an online services card, so you can get access to all of our online resources from wherever you are, whenever you are. And I'm going to say goodbye because we're over time. And thank you again to our authors, and thank you to everyone. Thank you so much. This was so fun. Thank you.